Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Hemophilia Federation of America's Pride Project webinar series. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Dr. Bobby Tran. I practice as an adult hematologist at the Comprehensive Bleeding Disorder Center at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, and will be moderating this webinar tonight. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few helpful webinar tips. This evening's webinar will last approximately one hour and is being recorded for future playback. We certainly welcome your participation and questions during the webinar. However, your audio will be muted during the entirety of the webinar as this helps limit background noise that may disrupt the presentation. If you have a question, we encourage you to type it into the question box located at the bottom of your control panel. Questions will be passed along to the presenter to be addressed at the end of the webinar. Tonight's webinar presentation is entitled Pride Project, How Do I Participate in Research as a Healthcare Provider? This educational webinar is the third in a six-part series to train and engage bleeding disorders stakeholders on patient-centered outcomes research and comparative effectiveness research. In this webinar, the focus is research participation for healthcare providers including, but not limited to, physicians, nurses, and social workers. Our presenter tonight is Dr. Jack Westfall from the University of Colorado School of Medicine. He is a family physician in search of rural goodness. He grew up in a small town on the windy plains of eastern Colorado. After attending medical school at the University of Kansas, he completed his family medicine residency as Rose Hospital in Denver and joined the faculty in the University of Colorado Department of Family Medicine. With the support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, he started the High Plains Research Network, a geographically based community and practice based research network in eastern Colorado that continues to address health issues important to the communities. He firmly believes that access to health care is a right and he works fervently to integrate primary care, behavioral health, and community organizations into local communities of solution. And with that, I would like to turn this presentation over to Dr. Westfall. Thank you very much. Jack Westfall here. I'm a professor of family medicine and have been directing the High Plains Research Network um, for 20 years. It's a group of practices in eastern Colorado, and we've been doing a lot of uh, uh, comparative effectiveness research and patient-engaged research. Next slide. This uh, um, is brought to you by uh, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI. We're going to talk a little bit about what PCORI is later in this presentation. Next slide. There are some specific objectives that we hope that you will get out of this. At the end of this presentation and webinar series, you will um, have an understanding of the basics of patient-centered outcomes research and comparative effectiveness research. We hope that the bleeding disorders communities with most patients are seen at hemophilia treatment centers where healthcare providers play an integrative role in the care of individuals and families with bleeding disorders. It's important for the providers in the community, the providers at the university, and the patients come together to help ask and answer important questions. Next slide. So it is inherently improbable that an academic researcher can ask a clinical question that matters to a patient. Now, it's not impossible, but it's inherently improbable. Patients are in the community, clinical providers practice out in the community, and sometimes academic researchers um, get a little bit narrowly focused, as in this example um, that is not related to hematology, but it is from an academic medical center, the jump distance comparing cat fleas and dog fleas. Um, so um, while that may be interesting to an uh, academic researcher, it may not be important to a patient. Next slide. What's wrong with our medical research? Well, inventing a new medicine or treatment is just the starting point for improving health. There's a famous study done by Bayless and Boren that estimated it takes an average of 17 years for just a small portion of new scientific discoveries to make their way out into day-to-day -day clinical practice in the community. For example, 
McGlynn reported that Americans only receive 50% of the recommended preventive care that they would be eligible for based on guidelines and evidence-based recommendations. Next slide. There are a lot of problems with our medical research. Sometimes it's limited validity of randomized controlled trials that may not have been done in the type of patients I see in my practice. Ambulatory practices are very different than tertiary medical centers. There aren't as many successful collaborations between academic researchers and community physicians and patients. One of the uh, solutions is this uh, webinar series and the work that the uh, Hemophilia Federation of America is doing to try to bring together academic researchers, community physicians, and patients to ask and answer important questions. Next slide. So some of it has to do with imprecise definitions. Um, Graham pointed out that patient-specific factors greatly affect physicians' treatments of heart failure. Um, and sometimes those are due to reliance on single measures rather than what uh, practices in the community see with a whole host of uh, issues in their patient population. Next slide. Lots of studies have been done on hemophilia and treatment guidelines are routinely updated and distributed. But there's still fundamental questions about how to implement those recommendations in practice. What's the right level of phys physical activity for my patient, for me as a patient, for my child? What's the risk of and benefit of substituting biosimilars for biologic agents? What are the outcomes? Patients want to know if the benefit is worth the cost of taking another pill or about letting their child play sports. Next slide. So I've interspersed a few uh, uh, slides for a little comedic relief. Consistency. It's only a virtue if you're not a screw up. Now we've been doing it the same way for a long time and we're pretty good at it. But it may not be the best way to ask and answer questions that matter to patients. Next slide. So why can't our best discoveries make it their way into our practicing physicians, their exam rooms, and our patients? And why isn't our research always relevant to our patients? Next slide. This is a very famous uh, box. It's called the Carr White Box. It was produced in 1961 by a famous physician named Carr White. And this describes some of the issues related to the research we do and how it's relevant, why it's sometimes not relevant to our patients. This box represents a thousand people <coughs> in the population, a general thousand people. Every month of those 1,000 people, 750 of them will report an illness or an injury. During that month, 250 of those thousand will consult a physician. Ten of those, pay, of those people will be admitted to a hospital, and less than one in a thousand will be admitted to a university medical center. Next. But that's where we do all of our traditional medical research, in that little tiny box, which is a very unique population of patients very different than the patients that you may be seeing in your practice, and certainly different than the people who live out in the community who may or may not be seeking care or even know that they have a medical condition or a bleeding disorder. <clears throat> Next slide. So how do you engage physicians, nurses, and medical practices in patient-centered outcomes research and comparative effectiveness research? Next. Well, what are these terms? I'm going to just do some definitions. These probably won't be too big of a surprise because their names are pretty intuitive. Patient-centered outcomes research really helps people and their caregivers communicate and make informed healthcare decisions, allowing their voices, patient voices, community member voices, and in this case, provider, uh, community providers' voices to be heard in assessing the value of healthcare options. What are the options? What can I do? How can I choose between the various options 
rather than simply having a cookbook of clinical guidelines, how do I make sure that the care that I get is relevant to me and fits in with the values of my life? Next slide. Peak, uh, patient-centered outcomes research answers patient-centered questions, such as, given my personal characteristics, where I live, who I am, my gender, my religion, um, my job, what should I expect to happen in a clinical encounter and with the medicine that you're offering? What are my options? And what are the potential benefits and harms of each of those options? Whether those are medical treatments, pills, IVs, or social treatments, activity, physical activity, etc. What can I do to improve the outcomes that are most important to me? If, my, if it's most important that I live a long life, how can I improve the chance of living a long life? If the, what I most value is living a full life with all the activities I want to do, how can I improve the outcomes of that um, value? And how can clinicians and the care delivery system help me make the best care decisions? How can we have conversations in the clinical practice so that those my values and my personal characteristics are taken into consideration when making choices about the treatment. Next slide. So patient-centered outcomes research assesses the benefits and harms of preventive, diagnostic, therapeutic, palliative, or healthcare delivery interventions so that people can make informed decisions. Again, it's inclusive of an individual's preferences, family preferences, their own autonomy, and their needs, focusing on the outcomes that they want rather than um, the guideline or the evidence-based outcomes research. They incorporate a wide variety of settings. This is where practices and community settings are so important, um, rather than in that little tiny box from the car white box. Patient-centered outcomes research is done in a host of settings with a diversity of participants to address individual differences and barriers to implementation and dissemination. Next slide. Well, what's comparative effectiveness research? Comparative effectiveness research is a, is a, goes hand in hand with patient-centered outcomes research. It's the direct comparison of existing healthcare interventions to determine which works best for which patients. So is it A versus B? A in this group, B in another group. Comparative effectiveness research can help inform patient-centered outcomes so that patients can choose between those uh, treatments understanding the greatest benefits and the risks. Next slide. Comparative effectiveness research is research that identifies what clinical and public health interventions work best for improving health. Interventions include not only elements of direct clinical care, such as diagnosis and treatment protocols, but also healthcare delivery, organizations and financing, as well as public health interventions in the community. In a comparative and effectiveness research study, interventions should be compared on the basis of some health-related outcome measure, and that health-related outcome measure should be something that matters to the patient. For instance, um, in diabetes, hemoglobin A1C is not necessarily interesting to patients. They care about vision, hearing loss, amputations, in a compare, study methods may include randomized controlled trials, intervention arms, database studies, decision analysis. The whole host of our research um, can be done in a comparative effectiveness research uh, method. Next slide. So here's one of the things that we're hoping that we can have from you. When we do research in the practices, sometimes this is the way it feels. I'm from the university, I'm here to help. Uh, university faculty, of which I am a professor of family medicine, uh, we have all the right tools. I, we have the yellow coats and the eyewear and the helmets and we have the hose full of water. But sometimes we don't know where the fires are. And so 
those of you who are out in clinical practice out in the community, whether you're physicians or nurses or social workers, woo, um, you know where the fire is. And so if we can partner together, we may have the research tools, and if you know where the fire is, we can work together to ask and answer the important questions in your practice and in the, for the patients in your practice. Next slide. So I said I'd talk a little bit about the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. They're funding this webinar and this work. Um, PCORI was established um, as part of the Affordable Care Act to fund research that can help patients and providers make better informed decisions about healthcare choices they face every day and guided by those who will use that information. So P Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute funds research that is guided by the people who are um, affected by the outcomes of that research, patients, community members, families, pr uh, providers. PCORI includes providers, patients, and other healthcare stakeholders throughout the research, from idea generation, prioritization of research questions, and then participating in the research as full participants. PCORIO provides awards to encourage engagement of patients and other stakeholders like this webinar. I'm glad you're all here. You are now part of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Next slide. Well, PCORI has three overarching goals. Substantially increase the quantity and quality of useful, trustworthy information to support health decisions. Speed the implementation. So we're trying to move from that 17 years to something shorter than that. And we can do that if the research is relevant to patients and providers rather than esoteric and um, uh, relevant only to the one in a thousand patients who end up in an academic medical center. PCORI also wants to influence clinical and healthcare research funders by others to be more patient-centered. For instance, they want to impact the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, the Agency for Health Research and Quality, the Centers for Disease Control, to also take on more patient-centered outcomes research and engaging patients in all the work that they do. Next slide. So PCORI has some basic ways to do this. First, engagement, engaging patients, caregivers and other stakeholders in the entire research process from topic generation to dissemination of those results. So here you are being engaged as caregivers and stakeholders and providers. Developing methods that promote rigorous patient-centered outcomes research methods. This is not loosey-goosey research. Um, PCORI has very uh, uh, I wouldn't say stringent, but they're very well thought out and rigorous research methods. Um, we want to fund a comprehensive agenda of high quality patient-centered outcomes research from common conditions to rare diseases. Dissemination should be patient-centered and get out to all the stakeholders who participated from the patients again and the practices where those patients are seen. Next slide. Well, PCORI has a set of values that I think you've probably, these won't be a surprise, patient-centeredness. Patients are our true north. And PCORI takes this seriously. They have patients who are on advisory councils. Patients review uh, funding opportunities. Patients are on review uh, of grants. Patients are um, participants, are required participants in all the research funded. PCORI relies on patient perspectives and values to guide and improve the work. Stuff has to be useful. PCORI focuses on funding that provides actionable answers. So while oftentimes research is good for research sake, PCORI values want the research to be useful at the, at the end user, whether the end user is a provider or a patient or a community member, PCORI values useful research. Transparency. PCORI wants to work in open, 
and facilitate public access to build trust, encourage participation, and promote implementation. Their board meetings are open. Their funding meetings are open. Um, while their merit reviews are individualized, the discussions of those are also open. So it's a very transparent organization. Uh, PCORI studies a broad patient population and seeks to provide evidence that is tailored to the patient's demographic or clinical characteristics. And PCORI still is consistently relies on the best available science to evaluate the work. PCORI doesn't generate new evidence as much as PCORI utilizes evidence-based medicine to uh, try and figure out how do we best uh, implement those, that evidence, and compare what works best for what patient. Next slide. PCORI aims to make the research findings more easily accessible to patients and providers. So all uh, research is required to have um, lay summaries for clinicians and healthcare providers, as well as patients um, uh, and the general public. PCORI wants to fund and provide tools for healthcare decision making so that patients um, have the language to ask and answer important questions with their provider and have the providers have the evidence to answer those questions. PCORI tries to make peer-reviewed publications available to providers and patients um, uh, through open access um, uh, publications so that anybody can read the research that is being funded by PCORI. Next. So what's it really take? Well, it can cause a little fear for some of us. Um, until you have the courage to lose sight of the shore, you will not know the terror of being forever lost at sea. Those of us new to patient-centered outcomes research and patient engagement sometimes are quite fearful of losing control of the research. However, BCORI understands that and really supports the, the joint efforts of patients, providers, and researchers to ask and answer questions. Next slide. Well, who gets involved in PCOR? patient-centered outcomes research and comparative effectiveness research. Well, I hope all of you will get involved. Clinicians, practices, institutions that want to work together. So Hemophilia Federation of America wants to work across the country with practices and patients and community organizations. You can participate in one study or many. Next. Maybe you're uh, wondering what's working in your practice or what's not working in your practice. What's the burning question that you have? What's the burning question your patient has? Maybe you have the solution. You can go to the next one. This the Community Research Portal is a platform used to collect data for research on the bleeding disorder community to more effectively serve the needs of patients and their families. Check this out on the uh, website. Well, what kind of research is possible in PCOR and CER? As I said before, descriptive studies of beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors about particular conditions or about particular uh, treatments. Um, participatory research is a major theme within patient-centered outcomes research where patients are engaged and actually participate in the research, not just as study subjects, but as co-researchers. Randomized controlled trials and pragmatic trials <clears throat> that are like randomized controlled trials, only they're in real life practices. Pragmatic trials are one of the strengths of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, where the National Institute of Health funds research randomized controlled trials that have very strict inclusion and exclusion criteria. PCORI likes to fund randomized controlled trials that have very loose inclusion and exclusion criteria because that's the kind of people we see in our practices. Not just that one in a thousand, but those others that are out in the community. <clears throat> Next slide. Practice-engaged research fits well with the vision of the NIH roadmap. 
to develop new partnerships of research with organized patient communities, community-based healthcare providers who care for sufficiently large groups of patients interested in working with researchers to quickly develop, test, and deliver new interventions. Organized patient communities, the Hemophilia Federation of America, community-based healthcare providers, not just academic providers, but community providers as well, who want to work with academic providers to ask and answer questions. Next slide. <clears throat> this is a, a schematic of the National Institute of Health Research Roadmap, which shows the translational steps um, from basic science research, animal research, translated into human clinical research, and then translate it into clinical practice so that it goes from the lab to the patient to the clinic and then out into the community. Um, <clears throat> PCORI helps extend this and make this move more quickly because the questions become relevant at the bench side. They become uh, more uh, feasible at the bedside and they become important and applicable and relevant at the practice. Next slide. Adding in this, no, go back. Adding in the real world settings, that patient engagement part is that next step to actually get to the whole population of people with bleeding disorders so that it's not just in the practice, but beyond into the community and families as well. Next slide. Well, the Hemophilia Federation is 20 years strong. Um, this is a great little uh, word um, cloud of the work that they do. You all are part of that, and I hope you'll become stronger parts of that through this PCORI award. Next slide. So what does it really take? What will you do? What will you do? What can you do? Well, come up with a research question. You know, people get spooked by research questions. They say, well, I'm in clinical practice. I don't do research. But I do have a problem in my patients. I have these three patients with this or a question. I have a question about how to best encourage patients to stick with their medical regimen. Perhaps you have a solution, something you figured out how to do for your patients that you might want to test in a larger population works in my practice. I wonder if it works in the practice across town or across the country. You can ask your patients to get involved as study subjects. That's the standard. Will you help us enroll patients in this study? But perhaps your patients could serve as, co as advisors or co-researchers in a project. How might you engage your patients to participate, not just as study subjects, but as co-researchers? Engaged patients <clears throat> can actively be involved in research with you and with the Hemophilia Federation of America and with the academic researchers in your state or region. You can join a research study. So I'll just say, ask the Hemophilia Federation of America, how do you do that? How do you get involved in a research study? Um, you know, sometimes there's some data to collect. We rely, as a, as a director of a practice-based research network, um, I rely on our practices to collect some of that data. And they have to ask, well, what's the benefit to the practice? And what's the risk? What's the workload? What's the burden on the practice to collect this data? And then sometimes it's working with other providers and practices. It, you may not have enough patients in your practice to ask and answer that question. So how can you work together in a group of practices with a group of patients to ask and answer something that matters? Next slide. So what's it really take? So this is a little slide we've created, the, the just right participant. Who should, who should do this? Um, participation and patient engaged and practice engaged research isn't for everyone, but it is for a lot of people. And some of the characteristics of the just right participant are curiosity. Patients and practices need to have some basic healthcare knowledge, maybe a little experience as a patient, but not necessarily. 
there, you need to have time. Um, sometimes uh, research requires some travel, so if patients need to come in, they can't need to come into your practice. That oftentimes is uh, a long distance. Uh, uh, my uh, practice is 100 miles from Denver, so my patients with bleeding disorders, uh, I can manage some of their conditions, but when they need to see a hematologist, they have to drive 100 miles. Same with participation in a, in a research project. We uh, think people need to be willing to take a few risks. So if you're set in your ways, uh, research may not be right for you. But if you're willing to take a few risks and uh, stretch a little bit, participating um, in uh, research can be very rewarding. <clears throat> Have a sense of purpose. So, you know, patients um, with bleeding disorders oftentimes have a sense of purpose around their condition, and you can tap into that. And providers who take care of those patients also have a sense of purpose to help those patients live happy, healthy, long, active lives. So using that as that sense of purpose to ask and answer a question that might help them live a happier, healthier life can really make a difference. Um, <clears throat> the just right participant needs to be able to think outside themselves put themselves in other shoes. So it may not be directly applicable to me as a patient or as a provider, but how can it help the other people in my life or the other people in my community or the other people in my practice? Next slide. And there's no end to what you can achieve. You can do anything you set your mind to when you have vision, determination, and an endless supply of expendable labor. That's what medical students can help us do, um, do great things. Our patients can help us do great things. Next slide. So we're challenging you tonight, don't be that rare physician, social worker, or nurse that participates. Don't be the rare one that participates. Be part of the crew that participates. Make the impact of hemophilia rare. It's going to have an impact. Hemophilia is going to have an impact. Um, we want to make the impact less and the serious impact rare. And you will still matter. You won't be rare, but you will matter. Next slide. These last two slides are some quotes from the Hemophilia Federation of America's website that shows some of the issues that patients and practices might be facing. My insurance company is trying to make me go through step therapy. How do I, how is that possible? What's the best way? What's the best treatment for me? Next slide. And the last slide. So it's very good that you joined us. We have some questions um, that people have submitted already. And I'll turn this back over to Bobby, Dr. Tran, to uh, organize those questions. And we can go through them over the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes so that we can uh, um, end on time. All right, well, thank you very much, Dr. Westfall, for that uh, helpful and insightful um, slides and information. So now we are going to open it up to uh, questions. Your lines will remain muted. However, you can type your questions in the question box at the bottom of your control panel, and I will read them off to our panel, uh, or I'll read them off to Dr. Westfall. So the first question that has come in is, Dr. Westfall, can you uh, tell us how can a patient play an active role in seeking out and participating in research? So how can a patient participate in research? Well, it's a, that's a good question. Um, uh, patients should talk to their providers about participating in research, either as a study subject or beyond that as a co-investigator or co-researcher or advisor. I think uh, a quick answer is to contact the Hemophilia Federation of America and tell HFA uh, 
I'm interested in participating in ongoing work and ongoing research. Um, if the patient's practice or provider is not participating, that doesn't exclude their ability to participate if they'll contact you as an academic researcher or their local academic research uh, center, um, or the HFA can help link them to people who are looking for patients to participate as advisors and co-researchers. All right, and our next question is, can you tell us about your experience or provide us with some examples of PCOR slash CER research you or your colleagues have done? And then there's several follow-up questions after that. Okay. Yeah. So we've done quite a bit of patient-centered outcomes research. As I said, I'm a family doctor. And so the research I've done is all over the place. Um, we have a practice-based research network that is rural and frontier eastern Colorado. And we've done projects on asthma and COPD and cancer survivorship. A recent, a recent project we've um, been working on for the last couple of years is around diabetes and depression. Depression is very uh, common in patients with diabetes. However, um, it's vastly under-recognized and under-treated, while at the same time having a significant negative impact on diabetes and the outcomes from diabetes. So we worked with a group of patients and community organizations who are committed to um, decreasing the risks of diabetes to identify uh, some potential um, research opportunities. And they developed a plan for a program called Check Your Sugar, Check Your Mood, which takes advantage of patients with diabetes um, ideas about an understanding of checking their sugar with a glucometer, and they've developed a moodometer for patients with diabetes to check their mood regularly. We're in the process of now trying to do a comparison between a comparative effectiveness research study between um, simply using a depression scale versus a depression scale with a additional bit of um, information on diabetes distress. So people who aren't necessarily meeting the diagnostic criteria for depression, but are still suffering from their depression and what the impact is. So that will be the comparative effectiveness research, um, comparing those two and their impact on um, long-term diabetes management. Another one uh, relates to uh, what's the best way to do diabetes education in group visits? Um, so those are a couple of examples of some comparative or some uh, patient-centered outcomes research that we've been working on. Okay. And so what um, challenges and lessons have you learned um, throughout this or throughout those uh, projects? And also, um, can you share those challenges and lessons with the audience? Uh, for those interested in incorporating uh, this type of research into their clinical care? Yeah, so, you know, when the High Plains Research Network, where I've been doing research for 20 years, started, um, we were working in the practices solely, and we were doing some pretty cool work on heart disease and heart attacks, but we were missing something. We weren't quite hitting it, and what we were missing was we were missing the local patient voice, um, and what when we started engaging patients in the work, suddenly um, the work became much more relevant. So the first challenge that we had to overcome was we were asking good questions. We just weren't asking the right good questions. And it goes back to that um, slide um, of the fire department. Um, I was the medical director of the Lyman Fire Department. That's an actual picture of my old fire and ambulance department in Lyman, Colorado. <clears throat> we were we were out, we had all the right equipment, but we weren't asking the right questions. And so that was the first challenge. The second is finding the right people. Well, that, that slide on the just right participant can help guide you as you think about what are the characteristics of the patients and community members and providers you wanna have involved in your research. Um, so you have to make the questions and the research relevant. It needs to be meaningful to the practices, and it needs to be meaningful to the patients. The other challenge 
um, is distance. So how do you actually um, how do you interact with patients? Uh, my guess is that uh, that the bleeding disorders community is dispersed vastly across the country. And so how do you pull people together? Well, travel and time are important things to overcome. And so um, we've we've worked diligently to go out to the community. Rather than forcing the community to come to the campus, we go there. That's a very important aspect of patient-centered outcomes research. Go to where patients live. Go to where the clinical practices are. <clears throat> The last thing I'd just add in this is that um, relationships matter. So building relationships with practices um, and doing that in person, looking across the table, breaking bread together, telling a story, listening to the person talk about the problems and issues they're facing, being with people both at the practice level and then with the patients helps build that relationship so that then those relationships become the glue that holds the group together as they're thinking about, well, okay, so what are the issues we're facing? What, what might we ask and answer? All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much for those, uh, those insights. Um, some other questions that have come up uh, include, are patients screened before participating in PCOR? If so, how? Are patients and screened before participating? Well, um, uh, depends on what kind of participation they're going to have. So um, patients who you want to engage as co-researchers or co-advisors as advisors to your organization, um, certainly you, you probably want to think about what are the characteristics of that just right uh, patient, that just right participant. Um, and I think a couple of the important aspects of that, back to that slide, are no singular agenda. So if, they, uh, if all they care about is one new genetic test, that's it. Then maybe you want to go to somebody who has a little bit broader concept. Um, for patients participating as study subjects, then while I said Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute tries to do more pragmatic trials and with less, um, uh, with fewer inclusion and exclusion criteria, or more inclusion and fewer exclusion criteria, there probably still are some exclusion criteria that would require, you know, uh, screening patients for participation in a project. Okay. And then a follow-up question to that is, will my patients who participate in PCOR be compensated? Uh, well, that is a, <clears throat> that is a, a, hot, a hot question right now. Um, so uh, but, um, sometimes yes, sometimes no. So our patients who are part of our community advisory council, um, when we started, it was a volunteer experience um, because there weren't funders that would pay for patient advisors um, at the time. Pete Corey and NIH has, have started providing the ability to incorporate into your grants budgets that will pay um, participants to, uh, patients to participate in the research. So um, there's a growing sense that um, uh, people who are participating as advisors and co-researchers should definitely be compensated for their time and energy, certainly for travel, um, for meetings, for gatherings, um, they should be compensated for that. <clears throat> it's not 100%, but there is a movement to compensate um, uh, patients for their participation in research. All right, our next question for you is, in the hemophilia treatment center setting, nurses and social workers play a significant role in the delivery of care. Can you tell us from your experience how these individuals impact research? Wow, well, social workers and nurses are crucial to successful um, broad-based, practice-based research. Um, uh, you need the whole team. Um, medicine is a team sport. 
uh, primary care where I practice is a team sport. I believe what you're where you're practicing in specialty care is also a team sport and what you've described as social workers and nurses part, uh, you know being important in in the clinical delivery of care translates also into the research. Um, they're on the front line of patient care. So sometimes patients will tell social workers and nurses things that they won't tell their physician. And so um, social workers and nurses can help identify some of the problems that patients are facing, whether that's patient problems um, that are specific to the clinical care they're receiving or the medications, but also problems with transportation or or education or you know understanding their condition. Um, uh, social workers and nurses oftentimes can spend a little more time with patients, and so they have a, a deep understanding of the sort of broader context that the patient and their family are living in. And so they are, I, I think, crucial uh, to the delivery of patient-centered outcomes research or the, the carrying out of, of patient-centered outcomes research. Thank you for the question, mm -hmm. because uh, um, uh, I want to make sure that, um, as we do in our practices in the High Plains Research Network, <clears throat> social workers, nurses, behavioral health providers um, are all part of the team, both the clinical care team and the research team. Yes, and so to follow up on that, if patient or if clinicians are interested in participating in PCOR, um, can you recommend any other resources that would be useful in either seeking out more information or seeking further training in order to carry out this type of research? Well, so the short answer is get to all these webinars because they're awesome and they will help provide you with sort of the broad spectrum of patient-engaged research, community uh, pa patient-centered outcomes research, and comparative effectiveness research. So make sure you look on the website for the whole schedule of uh, Hemophilia Federation of America's webinars. That's the first thing. Second, the PCORI website, which is PCORI dot, I think, dot org, has an extensive set of uh, educational training for providers um, and their patients in how, what are all the aspects of research that they can do. And there's actually, they've uh, just funded a new curriculum development for both patients and providers to teach about um, comparative effectiveness research and patient-centered outcomes research. That will be on uh, coming out in the next year. It's not available right now, but the PCORI website itself has quite a few resources for um, training in patient-centered outcomes research. The last thing I'd add is uh, many of you go to uh, national meetings and uh, national research meetings or national clinical care meetings, organizational meetings. Um, many times, and especially over the last couple of years, there's been a growing uh, <clears throat> availability of uh, workshops and presentations on uh, patient-centered outcomes research, comparative effectiveness research, and patient engagement. So take advantage of those at the at the continuing education meetings you do attend. All right. And uh, so what the next question we have is, can you comment on what your experience was like uh, applying for grants or awards or contracts for the PCOR? Uh, and the comparative effectiveness research projects, either with PCORI or through other research funding? Yeah, so I've had the good fortune of having four or five uh, PCORI awards, um, and uh, they're, they're very similar to other funding agencies. Um, there is a uh, request for proposals, and at this point in the life of PCORI, they accept letters of interest, and these are mandatory letters of interest. So you submit a four to six page letter of interest that outlines what your question is, how you've engaged patients in the development of that question, <clears throat> what you think this, the sample size will be, and then they review those. And from that group of 100 of those letters of interest, they may 
request a full proposal from half of them. <clears throat> so then you get an invitation to submit a full proposal. And then you write the full proposal. It's, you know, same, same, same stuff that you write for the National Institute of Health. But it has a little bit more um, generosity in, in sort of uh, a spirit because it, it does require patient engagement in all aspects, including so they need to be clearly uh, visible in the writing of that, uh, of that <clears throat> grant application. So you submit the application, then it gets reviewed by a group of people who are experts in research, patients, and stakeholders. So that may be community organizations um, or uh, uh, payer in insurance companies, or there's a few pharmaceutical companies who help review, but it's reviewed by at least some patients. So every proposal is reviewed by both researchers and patients, <clears throat> which is a real plus um, to the PCORI process. <clears throat> once you get once you get the award, then it's a bunch of paperwork and rigmarole, but uh, <clears throat> that's they walk you through it because they have funded more non-traditional organizations than any of the other funders in the country. So they're used to working with organizations that don't have a lot of experience managing large grants. And so they've been particularly good to work with because they are very helpful with the, the user end of uh, managing a grant. And you mentioned that uh, some of the reviewers are patients. Could you comment on whether or not these are patients with that particular disease burden or is it uh, patients in the community so, who are volunteering um, to review the process? Yeah, it's both. So people on this call can apply to become merit reviewers. <clears throat> Anybody on this call can be a, can apply to be a merit reviewer. I'd encourage you all to go to the website and consider becoming a merit reviewer. We need people who understand what life is like in the community and in community practices to be reviewers. So when you fill out that, rev that, that application, you put what your interests are, what your background is, and then um, they will pull from a group of patients who may have that condition and some patients who don't have that condition for the merit reviews. So they try to have a broad range of reviewers um, for that merit review. Right. Thank you. And so the next question is, uh, in terms of engaging patients, do you have any suggestions or advice on how to drive engagement or motivate patients to participate in this type of research? Yeah, so uh, I was just at a, at a meeting, a national meeting that um, had a bunch of patients at it. And I was struck by one of the patients said, well, I participate because somebody asked me. And I think that's the first that's the first lesson is ask people, ask if they'll participate. That's the first motivator is just ask them. Um, uh, oftentimes you don't have to convince them. You don't have to have a long spiel of here's all the reasons you should participate and here's here's the risks, but here's all the good stuff. Um, simply asking them, um, putting a flyer in your office that says, hey, we're thinking about doing this. Does anybody want to raise their hand um, is another way. Those are, those are the two sort of easiest ways to get people, get patients engaged. <clears throat> now, once you start having conversations with people, they want to know um, sometimes what's the benefit. And sometimes there is a direct benefit to, to a patient for participating. Maybe they get access to a new study drug. Maybe their family member benefits. <clears throat> but oftentimes they benefit from sort of that that uh, that sense of doing a social good, so part of their civic duty. Um, we did a project recently on biobanking and genetic research, and there was a large number of, of <clears throat> community members who felt that providing samples for a biobank was part of their civic duty. It wasn't going to benefit them personally, 
but it might benefit their kids, their neighbors, or somebody else in the community. And so there's that sense as well. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes, um, participating uh, as an advisor or as a co-researcher um, can be done both on the behalf of me as a patient, but also on my kids or my family members. I'm going to do this um, because I've had I know somebody who has suffered the bad outcomes of of in a, in uh, lack of access to quality care. So um, sort of the benefit to them or their family is another motivator that gets people excited to participate. All right, and uh, we actually have one last question uh, that is going to kind of put you on the spot, Dr. Westfall. But if you had a crystal ball, how do you envision the impact of the core or comparative effectiveness research in the next five or ten years? <laughs> wow. Well, you know, so uh, um, there's two parts to that question that I'll address. <clears throat> the first has to do with whether or not PCORI, the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, will be around. It was funded as part of the Affordable Care Act. It's up for renewal in uh, 2019. Um, I, my own personal advocacy is to push strongly for renewal of PCORI funding um, because I believe it's doing good work. Um, so that's that's sort of that you know it could anything could happen in the next two years in terms of funding for a national agency. The second part is patient-centered outcomes research is not going away. Patients have now participated. Community members have participated. They've seen what that means for the relevance, and that's not going to go away. So <clears throat> from a long-term perspective, whether PCORI is refunded or not, the concepts of patient-engaged research are with us. They're, it's, we're not, we, we're not it's a, that, the horse is out of that barn. We're going to keep moving down that way. And providers are going to benefit from that because the research is going to be more relevant. And they're going to have the skills and the tools to talk about patients with that in a way that's more meaningful. Patients will benefit because the research will be meaningful to them as well. And so I think um, patient-centered outcomes research and patient engagement are here for the, the long haul. All right. Well, once again, thank you, Dr. Westfall, for your time and uh, insightful presentation. Thank you all for attending this evening. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be available shortly on HFA's website under the resource library or on HFA's YouTube channel. Uh, if you have any questions, please contact research at hemophiliafed.org or simply reply to the webinar confirmation email you received. We also ask you to please complete the short evaluation that will pop up on your screen once this webinar concludes. Again, thank you and have a wonderful evening. Good night.